I had, uh, this is one of my, uh, one of my challenges is staying behind the podium. I tend to walk when I talk, but they don't have a lapel mic here, so let's see how I do. I'll hold on to this so that my legs don't move, I guess. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I'm really happy to be here, and I look forward to sharing information that NINDS has in the context of uh, the non-dilutive for, uh, forum and what we can do to help uh, move things forward. I'd like uh, maybe just a show of hands. How many of you are actually interested in or working in the neurology space? Okay. All right. Okay. So, you, so hopefully you won't be staring at your Blackberries for the next 15, 20 minutes. Okay, so what I would like to cover is sort of give you a little bit of a big picture, drill down very quickly. Some of this might also be done in the next talk, so I won't belabor the point, which is that, you know, NIH obviously funds, uh, uh, is, is a part of a larger enterprise of biomedical discovery and in fact is dwarfed by the um, investments made in the private sector. But you have to recognize that the bulk of the research is essentially basic research, and the second largest item would be clinical research, and translational research tends to be actually a very smaller, the smallest of the investments that NIH makes, but much more so um, these days under the leadership of Francis Collins and him setting up NCATS uh, and uh, other initiatives across uh, NIH to support translation. So if you just look at dollars, um, and this is now showing both NIH money as well as uh, NINDS money, can't officially talk about it, uh, fiscal year 15 uh, money because Congress has not actually approved the full budget. We're still in what's called continuing resolution land. Uh, the, um, but nevertheless, you can see that you know there have been some ups and downs, and uh, the, uh, the budget actually, in sort of actual dollar amounts, took hits in FY13 and 14 for both NIH as well as um, NINDS accordingly. And the, I, the reason I point this out is actually uh, to, to two points. But one thing that I wanted to point out is that for the first time, the spend from, the, from federal dollars for neuroscience has begun to exceed the spend in cancer or infectious diseases. You're going to hear from NIAID, which represents this bar here, and NCI, obviously, where most of the cancer money is spent. But the collective money spent with NINDS, NIMH, NIA, uh, and all the other institutes that do neuroscience together at the NIH now represent uh, the highest amount out of the 30 billion. But the real challenge with the, with, the, with the money situation is the decline in purchasing power. So if you look at this graph, and you, this is now NINDS numbers, and you see what the actual amounts were in, do, uh, in, in the appropriation, but if you index it to what 2000, uh, year 2000 dollars look like, we're basically back to where we were in year 2000 in terms of what, what the dollars can purchase out there using, the, uh, um, uh, using inflationary indexes. So that's the real challenge in the, in the budget perspective, which is that if, if we can't keep up with inflation, we're, you know, the, the budget numbers may look better, but in fact we're not actually able to fund more science than we were able to more than a decade ago. So if you look at NIH neuroscience research, we are the largest uh, institute that's fully committed to NIH and neuroscience research. All of our grants are tagged that way. And there are other uh, institutes that have percentages of their research that goes toward neuroscience, but these are the contributions to the overall NIH budget for neuroscience um, across the institutes. Um, so this is just a bar graph that shows you how that's split out. So many institutes, in addition to the top four that you see here, um, uh, do do uh, neuroscience research. So if you uh, drill down now into NINDS money, 90% of the money goes out the door, 10% stays in-house for intramural research and a little bit for the overhead to pay for staff salaries and whatnot. And this is the money that you're most interested in. This is what's going out to both companies as well as academics to fund research out there. And this is the area in which my office sits and have oversight over uh, about $100 million each year out of this, uh, this pot uh, to support translational research. And the bulk of the rest of the money, about $300 million or so, goes towards clinical research, and the remaining $900 million or so supports basic research, training grants, centers, et cetera, and the other things that um, uh, many NIH institutes uh, support. The problem for NINDS is this, which is that the unmet medical needs in neurological disorder is not one disease or two or ten, but it's hundreds. And um, I've intentionally made this slide so that you can't read the diseases, just to appreciate the fact that it's an extremely long list of disorders uh, that we have responsibility for. So one of the challenges that we have is when we get proposals from many of you and from academics uh, who are working in this area, 
we have only, you know, even though 1.6 billion is not chump change, it's still split across all of these diseases, gets diluted out very quickly. And it's hard for us as a funding agency to play favorites to say, okay, we'll pick this disease over that disease. And they're all our children and we have to look after them all uh, in that sense. Okay, can't, pay, can't play fav uh, favorites at this point. But the question is, can the science dictate which ones essentially are ready for prime time and can move forward and using that as a metric to essentially move things into translation of the clinic and maybe there are other diseases where more basic research needs to be done uh, in a, for a few years before they're ready for um, uh, uh, larger investments, which is usually the case in translation and clinical space. Okay, so the Office of Translation Research, our mission is to essentially move things from the basic disease, valley of death, if you want to call it that, uh, don't particularly care for that term, uh, into, into, the, into, the, into the clinical space. The way I think about it is that I would like to help the, the investment that we make in this office, I'd like it to in a de-risk uh, assets in such a way that other people get excited about funding them. So if we do things and we essentially put them on the shelf, nice paper published or maybe even IND generated, but then nobody actually tests the hypothesis in the clinic, then we haven't done our job. So what we're really trying to focus on in the, in the last two, three years is essentially ensuring that the things that we're funding have the legs to keep going forward. And that means engaging partners, downstream partners, VCs, large pharma who might be potentially uh, uh, picking up the, the research that we might fund. And coming to JP Morgan this year and last and other meetings in the last 12 months, we've been actively taking a role in trying to figure out how some of our existing grantees might be able to make that connections to downstream funders and not just depend on us for uh, you know, uh, cradle to grave funding, if you will, to get all the way. And as you know, we won't be able to get you all the way anyway. I mean, at, the, at some point, you're going to need to commercialize and and um, and and get this out to the patients. So, the, so, so from a guiding principle perspective, I wanted to put three things up front, um, which I want you to keep in mind, and hopefully, you can sort of we can come back to this paper, perhaps in the Q and A, which is that what I would like to see our f f grant programs focus is on getting the therapeutic to human, which I just mentioned. And I think for that, two things that are important uh, that I would mention is that uh, measures of PKPD, pharmac pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, are really important to start integrating very early on into the drug development process. And whether you're engaging the target, if there are measures of that, either direct or proximal or distal measures of that. And uh, it's a strong emphasis in many of the new programs I'm going to talk about to essentially uh, include that. The other bit that I kind of find very important uh, from my sort of pharma experience, if you will, is that you really do need to think about the end before you could start the beginning. It's, it's, you have to work backwards. It's the clinic that informs what you do in translation. And so the uh, translation begins and ends with the human in a sense. Everybody you know, re represents, and I will do the injustice as well by representing it as a unidirectional arrow from you know, basic to, to the clinic, but that's not the case. It's actually a circular feedback loop and we, we sometimes tend to forget that. So the point that, that I'm trying to make here is that if you haven't already, if you're in the early stages as an entrepreneur, the most important consultant you can probably get is the clinical consultant to, get, to come on board first to, to describe, explain to you what the unmet med need is in the patient and to then understand what the therapy needs to look like to be successful. In, uh, given the standard of care at the moment. So that then you're tailoring your project to get there and then your translational metrics or translational milestones will fit that goal uh, that you want to achieve from your business or commercial perspective. The other aspect that we've changed in the past couple of years is sort of bringing more of a maybe pharma style, if you want to call it that, uh, portfolio management approach to looking at what we fund and really establishing some pretty strict uh, um, guidelines to fail early, fail fast, and sort of uh, and holding projects um, feet to the fire, so to speak. So if you, I mean, we've had some very interesting experiences here. Uh, I won't name names, but early on in my tenure at the at the at the institute, which is now nearing three years. Um, discontinued a project and the investigator called up and said, who are you? And I said, this is me. And I said, well, what are you doing shutting off my fund? And this is my grant. I said, well, it's a, it's a cooperative agreement. It's a U01 and it has metrics in place in the notice of grant award and you have chosen to do something else with it. So it's no longer relevant to continue funding. He said, who are you to tell me what I can do with my money? Um, he said, my money. He didn't, it was, uh, I said, no, it's not your money. It's federal dollars given to you to accomplish a particular goal which you have not completed. So he put the phone down. He said, obviously, I can't talk to you. I need to talk to your boss. So then picked up the phone and he talked to you know, my boss, who was luckily supportive. I had already primed her. And then the next call was to the congressman. And the congressman's office then called us. And then we had to deal with, you know, why, is my, why are you taking money away from my constituents? Who are you to decide what research they should do? 
So there has been a little bit of a culture change that has had to happen to sort of recognize the grants that we are administering are not R01s. They're just, you know, they're not uh, open-ended research. These are product development grants, and therefore they need to have goals that need to be met. And if they're not met, we're going to take our investment and go somewhere else with it. So, and that, you know, now we've discontinued, I think, 15 or 16 such grants in our portfolio in the last two, three years. And so I think the word's out on the street that, you know, we're not just uh, sort of messing about with this and we're going to make sure that people are going to do what they claimed they wanted to do when they came in for the, for the peer review. And the last part is this important piece, which is that you, you can't do this alone. I mean, you know, there's this, uh, uh, we can fund a certain aspect of this uh, um, sort of proper, the project's life cycle, but you're going to need other funding sources to make this happen. And I think that was, Ram said it also in the beginning. And it's about networking to make sure that they're seamlessly integrated. And I sort of have come in with the, uh, with the approach that the NIH, or at least NINDS, has a role to play in ensuring that those partnerships also happen. And it's not just up to you as the investigator to make that happen. If we want our federal investment on behalf of the taxpayer to be worthwhile, we need to ensure that you're positioned well to essentially continue the project that we have funded to keep going. So we are on your behalf, and I'll tell you at the end how we're trying to do this, sort of having conversations with potential partners to get their interest up, and if we get their interest up, and then come back and connect with you uh, if you're interested in obviously engaging with them. So helping you do some of the matchmaking, if you will, that, um, that you might you know, obviously hire uh, consultants to do or business development folks within your uh, entity to do. So we're just one other way, hopefully, that we can do that for our particular uh, grantees. Okay, so the various programs, I'm going to go through these uh, fairly quickly. Uh, some of them I'll take a little bit more time, which are new. The first one I'm going to run through fairly quickly. And what, I, what I'm going to do uh, is that I'm not going to spend a specific amount of time talking about this small business program per se, not because it's not of interest to you, but because each of the programs that I'm going to talk about in principle has a small business element to it. And in fact, whatever I tell you that you can do, a small business can do it using the small business track or it can do it using a regular track, as Ram mentioned, that you shouldn't just be focused, I'm a small business, therefore the only money that I can access is the 43 million that is here. Some of the other uh, monies are also accessible by small businesses. You're just competing in a different pond, if you will, uh, when you do that uh, uh, in those settings. So the anti-convulsion screening program. Uh, show of hands, how many work in epilepsy or are interested in epilepsy? One, maybe two, okay. Have you ever heard of this program? No one. Okay, so this is, this is exactly what happens literally every time I give this talk. This, no one's heard of this program. It's been around for 30 plus years. It's a screening program that is, uh, was set up in 1975, 40 year anniversary coming up. It's a, run by a contract mechanism, a battery of seizure models uh, that, uh, uh, that in, and in 2007, for about five years, we also ran uh, a program to screen uh, chemicals for uh, uh, countermeasures, essentially um, uh, biotoxins. And in the context of what Ram said about BARDA, uh, we, also, we do the early work that actually hands off projects to BARDA. So if you're in the chemical defense space, NINDS's you know, counteract program or NIH's counteract program run by NINDS is, is critical to that, that, that mission and I can say more about that. So, so anyway, back to the ASP, the anti convulsion Training Program, we do the screening and we report the results back to the participants and advice on further development. And the person who supplies the compound retains the IP. The key is this program, when I came in, I didn't realize any, what, what impact it had. It actually has had a role in 10 drugs that, have, that are currently in the marketplace. Uh, so let me tell you what they are and how, what, what I mean by that. So if you look at the, ther the therapy development for epilepsy, you can sort of bin them into three generations, the black, the blue, and the green here. So the ASP has started 40 years ago before this wave of green drugs came along. Uh, uh, the, uh, into the marketplace. Now if I zoom in onto that green space, what I've highlighted for you are the 10 drugs that either originated as an initial screening hit in our program or where further data were generated that helped the uh, sponsor then move the compound forward. And by the sponsor's own admission, the ones with the red arrows are ones where they felt that if it wasn't for the federal program that was in place, they would not have actually gotten it all the way. It was the data generated there that got them internal funding or other funding to essentially move that forward. This is provided free of charge. I mean, essentially, you can bring a compound to us tomorrow, and if we believe that there is a reason to screen it through the assays and it has a mechanism of action or, or new chemical matter, 
then you know we line it up and within a few months you've got you know basically in vivo data uh, that goes forward and the one interesting thing about epilepsy as an indication which i know only a subset of you really care about at the moment is that the animal models are actually fairly predictive of the human setting, which we are not blessed with in, in most of the other situations in neurological disorders. And that's a philosophical point you can come back and discuss in terms of what does translation really mean in neurology when we have this real chronic problem with animal models not being representative of what, what happens in the human. Unlike, you know, I think our next talk, you know, in infectious diseases, you can, you, you have a better way of modeling things or you have a better way of modeling things even in oncology than you do with, uh, with brain function or higher order functions. So, so it's basically a pitch for a very understated program that is a small investment on, on, on behalf of the uh, federal dollars that has had an immense impact uh, as a catalytic function out there in the marketplace that's seldom sort of appreciated. So many, when I, when I present this, many other, um, uh, the question that I've often been asked is, well, can we have a program like this for our disease? You know, could we have one for... Alzheimer's, could we have one for Huntington's and one for that? I mean, in principle, yes, but the, the animal model predictivity problem comes into play. And the question of would you set this up and would that make a difference? And then the question you can ask is, well, how, how, did, how did it work out for epilepsy? And there's a little bit of an interesting conundrum there, which is, is it a chicken and egg? I mean, did the, did the program succeed because the models happened to be serendipitously uh, predictive? Or were they predictive because there was an iterative loop that I talked about, which is that we tested compounds in animals, got them to the clinic, learned from what happened there, refined the models over a period of four decades, which is why the program has the impact that it does. We're now moving the program away from being uh, just looking for symptomatic treatment because most of these are anti-epileptic, anti-seizure drugs. Essentially, they prevent the seizures when they happen, but they don't change the course of the disease or they're not disease modifying. So when you start coming up with disease modifying models, whether it be for Dravet syndrome or other pediatric epilepsy and whatnot, we may well lose that predictive power that we currently have with the anti-epileptics. And then the question becomes, okay, then what happens? How do you run a program that's a screening program that is uh, worthwhile doing and that is at the end of the day going to make an impact in the clinic? So I'm going to switch to talking about other programs now, but before I do that, maybe I'll just pause. Uh, if there are any burning questions about ASP, um, I'd much rather sort of have a little interaction if possible. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. So it's, it's, you know, it's one of the aspirations. So at the moment, the diagnostic space is only really covered by the small business uh, uh, enterprise. So many of the other programs that I talk about are really therapy development, either in large molecule or small molecule space. I personally am of the belief that you know drug development really does need to combine the, the diagnostic piece with the drug development piece. Either diagnostic in the perspective of you know finding the patients that you need to do the trial in or eventually who are going to get the medication. You can think about it from stratification perspective. So I think it's a key piece that we don't do the co-development and we don't fund the co-development right up front. And it's something that I would like to see happen in the future, but at present we don't have specific programs that allow you to do co-development or allow you to do um, de novo diagnostic development unless you are applying through the small business program where you can definitely develop diagnostics. Yes? Technical sure. Yeah, so, to, so the, how much drug is a, is a question that I can't answer off the top of my head because it depends on which assays you want to pick off the, off, the, off the menu to do, whether it's the initial assays or if you've done some of them and you want to go to later that. But I can give you that information offline or put you in touch with the person who can give you that information uh, in my team. The other question is uh, in terms of, um, uh, so, so repeat the question again, just to remind me. Sure, if you're not sure your drug Oh, right, the, the uh, route of administration. One of the things that we, when we sit down with you and we decide to screen your drug, we ask what information do you have about PK or bioavailability? How do we think about this and do we, can we give it orally? Does it have to be an IP? Does it have to be IV? What is the best way to get this in so that we can get an initial readout? And that's a, that's a joint discussion we have uh, to get some initial um, input into how the, drug, how, the, how the assay can be done at the contract site. So that's a, somewhat flexible depending on the drug that you bring in. Other questions? Yes. Um, are you adding models to your list? Yes. 
That's right. So at the moment, we're actually in a very, um, we've sort of ramped down the screening to actually focus more efforts on model development. We had a review of the program the year I joined in 2012 by an external group, which really pushed us to sort of think about epileptogenesis and uh, treatment-resistant epilepsy. So one-third of patients still are not helped by those, that long list of drugs that I showed you in that graph. They're still, uh, you know, they still have seizures. So the question is what's happening in them and why is that going on? And none of our models really address that. So the question is can we, are there models out there that we can incorporate as, a, as into our screening regimen to essentially be able to do that? And the challenges are robustness and, and throughput to be able to do that. Some models are really slow. You can maybe screen, you know, three or four compounds a year and that's not necessarily uh, helpful for us if we're running a screening program that might be okay in an academic setting. So these are things we're exploring at the moment. So if people have ideas about models that they think would be worthwhile in the epilepsy space, we'd love to hear about it and we can have offline conversations and I can put you in touch with the, with the program director who runs the program uh, who would obviously be able to engage with you more um, substantively. Okay, so I'm gonna switch now to sort of talk about the, um, the create programs, which is a new name of a program, and I'll tell you what it stands for. It's down here, actually, Cooperative Research to Enable and Advance Translational Enterprises. This replaces our old U01 program that we had. The U01 program is no more, so you don't have the traditional U01 program that NINDS has been running for the last decade. And it also, uh, and later on I'll tell you that this translational R21 program, which was meant to be a feeder program to the old U01 program, is also disappearing. Uh, has disappeared, actually. The last receipt date is gone, and so that will also be replaced by a new program that I'll tell you about. So essentially the suite of programs here is sort of an, this is the old snapshot and we're sort of replacing, um, uh, uh, replacing them with a new set of programs that we believe are better fit for purpose in terms of what we want to achieve. And the main goal in these programs is to achieve continuity of funding. So what we found with many of our investigators is they'd get a tranche of money, they'd get funded, let's say, in the R21 program. They will not have done everything that they need to enter into the next program. So therefore, there would be some gaps. And therefore, they would then have to go find funding somewhere else to fill those gaps before they're ready to then be competitive to apply for the U01 program. And then they would spend much time in that white space between funding cycles. So what we've tried to do is essentially set up funding programs where they're overlapping, such that by the time you end, pro well, you should look at the other way, I guess. I'm, I'm looking at it this way. By the time you end program one, you, you're eligible to start program two, so you can even apply nine months prior. So because it takes about nine months, as you know, from application to fund money getting into your bank account to be able to do something. And so it would be nice to do that, not at the end of a, a cycle, but nine months prior to the end of a cycle. So that's something that we're trying to achieve with all of our programs having some overlap. So the original program was launched in 2002, was essentially drugs, biologics, and devices all in one program. It was to stimulate the, the therapy development with a special review and milestone uh, decisions. We had 77 projects go through that pipeline over the year, most of them in dystrophy and stroke, but some other diseases as well. Uh, most of the modalities are listed here, you know, one third in small molecules, but there were also gene therapy, devices, protein, cell therapies. We, we sort of, it was an all comers program and everything was taken in and, 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 uh, and, and moved forward. So out of the 77, eight of them, so about 10% moved on to clinical trials. So you can just judge for yourself whether that's a good success rate across all those modalities and all those disease uh, disciplines. We also improved and sort of strengthened the peer review as well as the milestone sense we did actually, like I mentioned, stopped programs because they didn't achieve uh, the milestones that they were originally aiming for. And we've also generated, as I mentioned uh, in one of our objectives, interest from potential downstream funders. So most recently we've had a sponsored research agreement from Big Pharma for one, comp one project. We have a licensing deal that's about to be announced in a week or ten days for another one. And we've had pretty significant due diligence conducted by VC-funded incubators in rare disease space, especially uh, on several of our projects. And so these are all promising signs that the things that we're funding might be interesting to downstream funders. So those of you who might get funding from us hopefully would then be able to uh, find uh, other funding afterward. But we realized that there was opportunity for enhancement, and this is what the new program tries to achieve. So we felt that you know, we needed a more tailored approach that catered to the different modalities and that we needed to, like I said, reduce the delay between the, uh, the, the transitions. And that we needed more flexibility. That you know, In the past, projects could only enter if you had this 
you know, all of the boxes checked in terms of the, uh, the criteria for entry in terms of uh, assays and compounds and, uh, um, and, uh, and other uh, readouts, et cetera. And that made it very, very restrictive in terms of where a project could begin. So if you had already, for example, in small molecule space, completed medicinal chemistry, and you just wanted to then get going with essentially formulation and pre-IND enabling studies, we had no way of accepting you in the past. You, you, were, you were too late for the program in a sense. And that felt sort of almost punitive. It's like, why, why should that be too late? Why can't we help that? So now we've created a program that essentially would allow you, us to take programs at different stages all along the continuum. Of course, this funding period will be shorter. The amount of money you'll get will be less if you're, st you're coming in you know, not, so far, not so early. But that's, that's, that, that should still be helpful for you to get to where you want to get to, which is the IND or the clinic. So the CREATE program, which is specific for the biologics, which includes all of the modalities other than devices and small molecules, so peptides, gene therapy, everything falls into this program. It's still a little bit of a um, um, catch-all program from that perspective, but it's harder to subdivide at this point. And we have two tracks. The U01, the, the, the discovery track is still run with the U01. It can be up to uh, uh, four years. Uh, we would expect it to actually be shorter in most cases, especially if somebody has all of the pieces in place. It might be one or two or three years. It depends on what you want to pursue. And it would have the standard milestones to be able to you know, be uh, progress or, or stopped uh, at, at, at each, um, each yearly point. And if you then have a candidate that you can then move into the development track, then you would go into a new mechanism that we are piloting at least within NINDS, and the NIH has, has about a decade's experience with this, which is the UH2, UH3 split mechanism. And so the UH2 is a preparatory phase, which then moves into a UH3 phase. And the key about this particular mechanism for us, for the, uh, for the biologics, is that we have now allowed clinical trials to be done in the same mechanism. So you don't have to finish, pre uh, get an IND, and then apply for a new grant to get the uh, money for the clinical trial. If you, everything is going along, there would be an administrative review, and you would be able to pick up and essentially run your first-in-man trial and get that, get that done as part of the package you could then uh, take to some downstream, um, downstream investor. Okay? And we don't, we don't specify limits. I mean, I've sort of said sort of general guidelines here. In fact, if you read the uh, funding announcement for the, uh, for, for the development track, uh, there is no budget limit in the sense that you could propose a larger budget than 1.5 million per year. You're just going to have to justify it, and Ruby is going to have to believe that you will spend those monies judiciously. So you can't just ask for 5 million, and there's nothing to justify us giving you $5 million a year, for example. Here, what we have suggested is that the discovery track is smaller activities, and the NIH, you probably know, has this rule, if any of you have navigated the process, is that if any grant is more than five, requires more than $500,000 a year in direct costs to the entity, whether it be small, small, a company or uh, an academic, it has to go through a pre-review before it can, pre-approval before it can even go into review. And so we are hoping that most people who come into the discovery track will choose to keep the budget under 500K to essentially be faster through that process and not have to go through that gauntlet of having to get it reviewed. But if you still need more money, because let's say, for instance, you're doing a primate model up here and you can't do that with less money, so be it. We'll, 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 we'll work through the system and get the approval that, that is needed as long as it's required. Okay? For devices, what we've done is we've split it out into three tracks. Now, I'm not a device expert. I can't even actually speak to what each of these specifically, um, I keep forgetting what they specifically achieve uh, as, uh, uh, in the, uh, as mechanisms. But the, the, the point is that each of these has a different regulatory path with the, with the, with the CDR edge. And therefore, it, it was incumbent upon us to ensure that the um, projects that were being reviewed as research devices were not being compared against therapeutic devices and compared against PMA devices because that was, not, that was an apples to orange comparison in the review stage. This allows us to essentially do like-to-like -like comparison and fund the best research devices, the best therapeutic devices, and we hope that, that folks in the device space appreciate this particular aspect of the program. One interesting uh, fallout of the, the um, BRAIN initiative, the Obama BRAIN initiative, um, that has garnered more money towards uh, funding some of the early research and many of the funding opportunity announcements that came out, if any of you have been keeping track of that, those funding opportunities in terms of technology development are very device heavy, actually. So those of you in device space, you know, you should see this as a real bonanza coming for the subsequent years from the federal side. There's a strong emphasis on developing better devices uh, when it comes to thinking about neuroscience. 
Any of you uh, applied to the FOAs that the Brain Initiative uh, put out? Is there anyone in the room who, who, who attempted to do that? Okay, there's one person in the back there. And so the point I was trying to make is that what we think will happen is that if, those, if the people who are developing devices or early concepts for devices through the brain opportunities, we believe will be fit for purpose or ready to enter some of these um, uh, programs that we have set up. So we believe that those two are going to be quite complementary, but they will have to run through their cycle before maybe many programs come to us, graduate from that program to come to us. Okay, I'm going to pause here again and ask if there are questions about the biologic side before I switch over to small molecules. Any questions about sort of large molecule drug discovery and how we're attempting to fund it? Yes? Um, just to clarify, the optimization of the um, 500 um, per year, this is for the biological side of the disease. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Other, pro yes? I'm curious, you had on one of your slides, you had a dog center. That's right. And No, so I mean, we funded that center very early on in the in the U01 program, so we sort of formally listed there, but it didn't actually last very long. The funding, I think, was gone after two or three years because the center didn't achieve all of its objectives. But the, in principle, the the idea of large animals and their importance to neuroscience is something that we're taking very seriously, and it's something that Amir, who's standing in the back there and will be at the table during the um, uh, panel discussion, is trying to put together um, a funding announcement that will specifically address this need that people have in the field to do animal studies which are with uh, things larger than a rodent. Are, are you aware that 1% uh, of German shepherds have the SOD1 mutation? Yeah. Very yeah. And you know we've we've spoken to many people who have. I mean, I think there's a beagle uh, colony that the a group in Canada is maintaining that has many of the symptoms that uh, are recapitulated in degenerative diseases, etc. So we've heard many of these uh, aspects of you know uh, dogs in particular being very relevant to, of course, you know, the classic narcolepsy pieces. You know, everybody knows about that. So yes, this is an unmet need that we are trying to address at the moment. We don't have one that I can announce to you right now that says that's taken care of it. But maybe a year from now, that would be the case. Other questions about large molecules? So we will have two receipt dates for this program. Uh, again, I don't uh, tend to res list receipt dates because they can change. You can go to the website and take a look at them. They're all listed there. Um, the, we had one in October. The next one is in February. We'll have two per year rather than three, and that's an internal technical uh, reason for doing that as opposed to uh, the most other programs that you're probably used to having three receipt dates like in the SBIR program. This will have an SBIR track, so if you wanted to come in, instead of the U01, it would be a U44. If you've ever received a U44, the UH2, UH3 would be converted to a U44, and so therefore, you know, uh, small businesses can still access this, these amounts. The, the, there are slightly different um, budget caps when you go into the SBIR track that you will have to deal with, and then you'll have to, we'll have to navigate. If you wanted more money than the caps allow, at the moment we have a waiver that allows it to exceed those caps so we can still uh, try to get you the money that you're actually asking for. So when you look at the SBIR program, often people say, oh, you know, tiny amounts of money, they've really made it strict, you don't get you know, as much as we used to even before 2012. That is really not the case because we have worked to get waivers in place for a subset of our portfolio where if it's needed, we can argue argue for exceeding those caps that have been established by Congress, so keep that in mind. Okay, blueprint neurotherapeutics. So this is the way NINDS has chosen to now, going forward, do small molecule drug discovery. So it's different from the, the, the CREATE program that I just told you where it's a grant or cooperative agreement program where the monies come primarily to you and you then decide how to, how to spend it. You can spend it in your own laboratory if you have wet labs or you can do it through CROs or other, other mechanisms if you're a virtual outfit. But in Blueprint, the way we have set this up is that we take a network of contracts that we have set up to do medicinal chemistry, data management, PK talks, and now formulation, and soon we'll have phase one activity as well. And so you bring in your idea, and we have the work done for, on your behalf through these entities. And we, we work with you in the lead development team. The principal investigator would be someone from your end, uh, outfit, 
The, we have several consultants, and I'll show you the list of consultants. Some of the names should be familiar to you. And the NIH staff, for example, Chuck Saiwan and Amir, who are both in the audience, they're both uh, deeply involved in some of the projects in the portfolio and are in you know, biweekly meetings to try to figure out what happens, needs to happen next at each of the CROs, and then manage the project based on timelines and budget to get it executed. Some bit of money goes back to you to essentially probably um, most likely to do some of the biological studies where the assays are most likely developed by you and it's not as easily transferable to a CRO site, um, but that doesn't tend to be the bulk of the money. But the value of the, of the investment we have calculated, it tends to be about, you know, on average $2 million a year for the five years of the program. So if a project goes all the way through from soup to nuts through the therapy development, small molecule therapy development, it has been a $10 million investment on behalf of NINDS to help you get, to, uh, get, past, get, get through phase one, okay? So here are some of the consultants. We've got consultants for assay development, medicinal chemistry, DMPK, talks, and we pull these people in as needed. As the project evolves, we bring people in, sunset other people out, and so it's a very nimble team that's again managed by the NIH staff to bring in the expertise. And these are all ex-pharma, biotech, uh, seasoned consultants who know, have been around the block, developed several drugs, got them to the market, so they know what they're talking about when they, when they essentially are advising the teams on uh, steps to take, left or right. And in fact, you know, one anecdote in this space is that the consultants become so excited about some of the projects. Uh, in one particular case, they actually wanted to set up a new co with the project that they were for consulting on, which of, of course was a conflict of interest for us, but nevertheless it was a great outcome because we then spun it off and they went off and did that. We just couldn't have them serve as consultants anymore, but uh, gives you an example of where someone can become that excited that they actually want to you know, become personally involved more than just consulting. So the goal for Blueprint is not different from what I told you at the beginning, which is that projects have come in at different places, but then they, the exits can be for a variety of reasons. It could be for termination, it could be for actual funding, and that could be from venture or industry partnership or other grants, and we're hoping to start these conversations for handoff early enough such that uh, the handoffs happen at the appropriate time for each project. And the hope is that we are trying to decrease the risk or de-risk the project such that others become excited about it. And as we well know, many people have walked away from neuroscience, at least in the large pharma sector, uh, in terms of doing the work in-house and sort of are outsourcing it. So it's incumbent upon us to ensure that when they are ready, which they will be for sure, because there's just way too much money to be made in this sector for them not to be, um, that they will come back. And so that we are ready with de-risk projects at that time, you know, that we have funded, that they will then be willing to fund and take all the way through to the clinic. So milestone driven, essentially at each stage from exploratory studies to chemistry to preclinical, there are sort of, you know, it whittles down and we have an external review committee. I've listed the current members of the committee. Jeff Kahn is, at, um, at, uh, is, the, is the academic on the committee. The others are, are, are ex-pharma consultants or are, on, uh, are uh, running their own venture or biotech companies. And we're going to add a couple of more people to that. So one plea actually I would have both for the, um, the review committee as well as um, the consultants. If either you have the expertise or you know of people who can serve in these roles, let us know because we're always looking for the right kind of expertise to tap into these programs, not only for small molecules but also for the CREATE program that I told you. We have a way of being flexible enough to bring in the relevant consultants. If you're working on a gene therapy product and that particular gene therapy expertise doesn't exist either in NIH or at the PI, then it would be great to bring that in as opposed to sort of you know, blindly going forward and making some mistakes that then doesn't get us where we want to be. So one important aspect about the running the program this way, you were probably used to the previous sort of the, the grant version where of course the, uh, due to the Bayh-Dole Act, everything, all the IP stays with you. So you might be concerned, okay, if I'm not doing the work and the NIH is getting the work done on my behalf, does NIH own the IP? And the answer is no. The, uh, the IP is still assigned to you if you are the ones coming in with the project. And we have pre-negotiated that with each of the CROs that we work with, that they assign that. And the consultants also enter into an agreement from an IP perspective that they would, that the, that they, that they would do that. So there is, there is no, no IP risk in essentially thinking about this program uh, going forward. Uh, you know, who applies, people who are new to drug discovery, people who are experienced but don't have the facilities to do it, so if they're virtual shops and they want to get it done, and both academics and small companies have applied. So if you look at our projects at the moment, here's a list. We, have, uh, we had 15 projects enter the portfolio, 
Uh, we have discontinued the ones in red uh, because they didn't meet specific milestones. You can see several companies represented up here. You can see the disorders listed here. And this actually brings to an important point, which is that this is one program in which the mission transcends NIH, NINDS, to all the other institutes that work in the, in the cooperation that's called Blueprint, to the 15 institutes that work in neuroscience that all pool monies together, and that's how they, we have um, projects in smoking cessation, which is uh, the Drug Abuse Institute, and macular degeneration, which is the Eye Institute. These are not uh, uh, diseases that uh, NINDS is primarily responsible for. And one point of correction that I wanted to make to what Ram said about the increase in the budget to NIA for Alzheimer's, NINDS is actually not primary for Alzheimer's. It's NIA that's primary for Alzheimer's. We take care of all the dementias that are other than you know, frontotemporal dementia and other things that are not Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's has always been tagged as an aging-related uh, um, uh, phenomena. So all the monies that have ever been provided through the uh, NAPA Act, not the auto parts, but the National Act for whatever um, uh, uh, programming uh, Alzheimer's, provides money that most of it goes to NIA. But we work in very close partnership, as shown here, where we have two programs in Alzheimer's that we help NIA uh, move forward using, using these combined resources. So the portfolio at the moment from a sort of a stage perspective is sort of uh, sitting like this, few projects at the candidate selection stage, uh, you know, maybe a year, year and a half away from uh, doing that phase one trial and then graduating for the program, others a little earlier, some may survive, some may not. Now we have a new receipt date for new programs to enter. This was round one with the program when we took these 15 in. Now going forward, it will be a continuing cycle of essentially new programs that can come in. The only uh, constraint will be how much can the network that we've already set up for the CROs, how much work can they take? And, and that will be the limiting factor for how many projects we can essentially manage at any given time. So what is new in this uh, in Blueprint going forward, there's a much greater flexibility of how much work gets done at the contract site as opposed to at your site. And so in the past, most of the work needed to be done at the contract site. But if you are a card-carrying medicinal chemist and you would rather do your own chemistry, there's no reason for us to force you to do the chemistry through a CRO. So we would much rather give you the money to do your own chemistry, and then when you're ready for PKN talks, you can come and use our contracts. So we're thinking about it being much more flexible from that perspective. Whatever serves the science is sort of the um, motto here. Flexibility and entry point I mentioned before, and once again, the SBIR track is available for this program as well. So, Projects can enter multiple places, uses the UH2, UH3 mechanism or the U44 mechanism uh, to essentially get stuff done. So I will skip the idea. So the only point I will make here is the first receipt date is uh, February 11th with peer review in May, going to the September Council where we will have decisions. And right now all of these indications, psychiatric, neurological, um, age, uh, dementias of aging, which are, includes Alzheimer's, uh, developmental disorders, which means uh, childhood development, Chronic pain conditions, alcohol uh, dependence, and drug, drug addiction are all in the mission for the new program that has been launched uh, uh, with, Blue, with Blueprint. So let me, um, I won't belabor the uh, budget guidance. You can ask us questions in terms of that. Again, the guidance is very similar to the other one, which is that you, you ask for what you need, and we work with you uh, to make that happen. Again, like I said, if it's above 500K, you have to go through um, uh, additional approvals. The, the, the key that I would always say is read the funding opportunity on front. This is not your standard whatever variety um, uh, funding opportunity announcement. And the most important thing I would again bring, come back and I will reiterate another slide, is pick up the phone, talk to people who are running the program as opposed to just sort of winging it and sort of navigating it yourself. We are here to help you and try to put the uh, best case forward for you to be successful in review. And we can help you up to the point of essentially giving you guidance and then we step back and let review take its course before we re-engage again. But our job is not to be a roadblock, our job is to help you get the funding if your project merits it. You can have these slides, so you don't need to take pictures of them. I'll be happy to provide them. So the most important thing, like I said, talk to NINDS staff. And then, of course, know the review environment, know who's reviewing you, check out the FAQs, and of course, keep many of the things in mind that you probably would if you were talking to any investor in terms of the target product profile, think about the team, of course, your data package needs to be robust and that you're, pro you're pro proposing real uh, experiments with you know, clear go-no-goes. And again, I would, I would say something here which has been said in a couple of panels that I've been involved in this week, which is the willingness to, c to 
to commit to performing the killer experiment early on, the one that will essentially, the one that you don't want to do, but if you, it, uh, because that is, that is the most important thing as an entrepreneur so that you don't spend time spinning wheels on something that isn't going to work. It's better for you to essentially stop something early and then pick and go, but go, go start something else as opposed to not being willing to do the experiment that might stop your project. So think about that a little bit. Okay, pause here and ask about the small molecule program. Any questions? I went through that fairly quickly. Does anybody have a time check for me? I don't know how much time I've left. It's 10 past 10? Okay. Uh, really depends. I mean, the standard rules for applying IP apply. You know, uh, in a sort of uh, assignment applies in these in those situations. We don't deviate from how it might be done in any other situation. Sort of depends on what the institutions are and where the co-PIs are. If it's two academics, one academic, one company, two companies, that tends tends that will have to be negotiation between you folks to sort that out. The NIH is not a party to those discussions. Other questions about small molecule drug discovery. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is actually talk about the fact that, you know, once we put these two larger programs in place for develop, doing development, we realized that we still had some gaps between where the basic science is done and getting to being ready for those programs. So essentially, sort of feeder programs like the translational R21 that used to exist, we felt weren't really gonna get programs to, do, to be ready to enter to, for us to commit million dollars a year for five years or, you know, or more. Um, so we spent some time really thinking about what are the precursor programs or feeder programs need to look like and what do they need to achieve to get there. And we felt that there were really three things that they needed to achieve. They needed to have a bioactive agent, whether it be large or small molecule, or you can think about it from a device perspective. They needed to have the relevant assays to essentially optimize the molecule that you have. And they needed to have measures. If you don't have measures of efficacy because the model is not predicted, then at least pharmacodynamics. You show that there's target engagement and that you're doing something in the molecular pathway that you're trying to interface with such that we believe that the drug works in the body the way it's supposed to. So how can we get funding in place to ensure that these three pillars essentially are supported? And so that led to the creation of a new program. It's called IGNITE. IGNITE stands for Innovation Grants to Nurture Initial Translational Efforts. Um, Amir, who's standing in the back there, was the sort of the architect of that program. So he's the one standing there. Uh, wave your hand, right, okay. So the new programs are listed here in green and how they dovetail with the two programs that I've just spoken to you about. So we have a new program that launched in December, first receipt date coming up in about four or five weeks that focuses primarily on assay development. So if you don't have an assay that's ready for prime time, needs to be uh, you know, brought up to snuff, this is, this is the place essentially to, to come in with ideas for that. If you have the assay, you have the compound, but you still haven't figured out what you're gonna measure in terms of efficacy and PD, you've got a second program that, uh, that, that we have launched, which is really focused on that. So we've split it out rather than all of these things being reviewed, uh, apples to oranges again, so that people can look at all the assay development programs and say which are the best assays we want to fund this year or in this cycle. These two are coming soon. The animal model development I mentioned, especially with the large animal component, we're working on this. We hope to get that out on the street later this year. And then I think we've, we realized in our analysis that there's a larger need to really think about platform technologies in, neuro in neuroscience and where that could be supported by uh, federal dollars. And so the sort of the, the low-hanging fruit example that I always use to sort of illustrate this is, you know, can we be more creative in thinking about how to deal with the blood-brain barrier and what we might do to get drugs across it? And if there are new technologies that we could support to make that happen, then this would be a space to do that. There could be other such, other such ideas that people could come up with, but that's in principle an uh, sort of an illustrative idea of what we are hoping we will be able to fund in this space. This pro these programs are sort of standard um, Amounts actually, it's listed in the other next couple of slides. So the first one, in vitro, in vitro, in vivo assays. Uh, it's an it's a split mechanism. That's an R21, R33 mechanism with a milestone in the middle. So if you set up some assays and you need to kick its tires over two years, if you don't get the first year stuff done, then essentially we have an opportunity to sort of say, look, you know, it's not it's not working out. So we're not going to provide you subsequent years of money. Maximum amount that you can ask for is 250k per year or 750 over the three years, um, and that's sort of the standard modular R01 uh, kind of amounts. 
So the, two, the, uh, the transition will be contingent, as I said, about the milestones. The entry criteria is that you're working on something that's novel and interesting, and you have strong biological rationale, and you have a therapy development plan in which the assay will actually make sense. And the receipt dates are listed here in the slide. Um, uh, first one in February, and then June and, and October. So standard receipt dates. The second one, which I talked about PD and in vivo efficacy, so the idea is to essentially develop those PD markers, and again, using the R21, R33 mechanism, same budgets, and the idea here is to show that the, that, the, 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 that the therapeutic agent has an opportunity to be viable and can support um, uh, the, uh, you know, it can justify essentially moving forward into the uh, later stage development and can drive those activities when you're, when you're there. So those are the details on these two and coming soon. The key advantages we think for this new program is that first of all, it allows you to get those pieces of data that were missing when people were applying to the uh, precursor programs and that we hopefully have solved this problem, we hope, of the white space between funding programs. That if you finished, you got an Ignite grant or a couple of these grants, first the assay development and the PD measures, you would then be ready to just sail into either create or bio, depending on whether you're large molecule or small or devices, and then, um, and then you know, you're good to go. Ignite doesn't support device development where, because we think that much of the device, early device development can be supported by the create uh, devices program itself. So it doesn't need a device component per se here. Now remind me, Amir, does this have an SBIR component? It does not, okay. Because the standard SBIR um, once can essentially do this with the regular SBIRs, is that the idea there? Uh, not necessarily. Yeah. It just doesn't yeah. Okay, so let me pause here, ask about anything about the precursor programs. Yes. Um, where do um, pet tracers fit in there? Yeah, a very good question. So I think this is one where we would either see it coming in through that PD uh, mar target engagement or efficacy measure marker as uh, the second of the two programs that have already been launched. You could also imagine it, it coming under the platform technology piece that we haven't launched yet. So I think it's a great point that you make that you know our ability to essentially use pet tracers to look at occupancy in the brain, show that the drug is getting there, is a key piece to the therapy development aspect, especially with this in cases where you're Inter interfacing with the CNS, and we uh, we would love to support more of that if there are ideas out there. Yes. In terms of blood-brain barrier, which is obviously critical for any neurological agent, about two percent of drugs are blood-brain barrier uh, penetration. Correct. So, do you have any programs where one can submit compounds to to see whether either in silico or in vitro or in animals you get blood-brain barrier? We don't have any programs in which that kind of testing can be done. Obviously, there are you know, standard assays that are available to show you whether that's, uh, you know, penetrant or not. What we are hoping for is, you know, perhaps new ideas how to make drugs penetrant without having to sort of always, you know, does it always require fixing the chemistry of the molecule? Is there something you could fix in the biology, in the brain that essentially allows you either to carrier molecules or other ways to make the, um, the barrier porous uh, temporarily, if you will, to allow the relevant drugs to enter when administered. So these are the kinds of things we're thinking about. So we don't have a screening program like the anti-convulsant screening program to tell you whether your drug is blood-brain barrier penetrant or not at the moment. Other questions? If not, let, oh yes, go ahead. Okay. So, dev, so funding for the new devices would fall um, into the uh, device program, which can either be create devices if it's uh, sufficiently along in the development, but if it's an early space. The SBIRs are broad enough that they support device development. So if you're a small company, I think that's the place I would advise you to go to for small device development for, for imaging. We don't have a specific program per se that essentially helps device development for imaging as a, as a, as a narrow focus. So let me spend a couple of minutes, given that the BARDA discussion happened earlier, otherwise I would have skipped over these slides and talk about the Counteract program. So the Counteract program is, uh, you know, the burden of illness from chemical, chemical uh, toxins is well documented. It can be through warfare, it can also be through, through sort of terrorism, or it can also be industrial accidents, which are all actually more common than the other cases. We hear more about these, but this happens all the time. Tain derailment, uh, chlorine gas here, there, you know, uh, poisoning cases all the time. Uh, that are going to um, uh, poison control centers across the nation where we don't have appropriate remedies or antidotes to help them. 
So the mission of the uh, Counteract program is to essentially understand the fundamental mechanisms uh, um, uh, of toxicity caused by um, chemical agents and then to figure out how we can get therapies that we can then pass on to BARDA, which can then eventually, if relevant to national security, can be stockpiled. So just an illustration, if people don't appreciate how it's sort of, um, sort of staggering the problem is. So this is your standard penny. You've got Lincoln in the middle there. If you can see Lincoln's head, if a drop of sarin the size of Lincoln's head were to be put into this room, we would all be dead within minutes. Okay. If a drop of sarin were to be released into the hotel's uh, you know, ventilation system, there would be close to 50% mortality and then quite a lot of morbidity subsequently. And, so, and this is in fact, this is sulfur mustard. And this person was exposed to sulfur mustard 24 hours earlier, had no symptoms when that was done. So sulfur mustard exposure is innocuous. You don't feel it at that time of exposure. So you go home and 24 hours later, you start blistering like this. Okay, so these, these agents you know, they are pretty nasty and we have no ways of essentially dealing with uh, the sequelae. You think about the um, you know, Tokyo subway incident from uh, you know, more than a decade ago where sarin gas was used and that led, that then has been followed up and those patients have shown some pretty interesting decrease um, in white matter. Over, over time, even though they survived the attack. And so there are some long-term sequelae here to the brain from exposure to these things that we have no, help, no way of helping um, uh, the general population with. So that's what the mission of this, uh, this program is about. NIAID, whom you're going to hear about from next, actually oversees the entire biodefense program. And the two arms that are biological and radionuclide actually sit with them for management. And because chemical weapons tend to usually affect the nervous system, we manage this program, which is about $45, $50 million each year uh, committed to it. So obviously, the bulk of the money goes to biologics, which is where the, um, the threat is seen to be the, 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 the largest, and then sort of equal amounts of money for the other two uh, legs of the stool. So the chemical classes, 50% are nerve agents, but there can be others that are metabolic. So you uh, ingest it like cyanide, or you breathe it in like chloride, or you get it on the skin like sulfur mustard that I just mentioned. So we've got several projects in the pipeline, and the idea would be once these projects actually move far enough, we would hand them off to our already committed development partner, BARDA. And in a, in a sense, from a risk perspective, those people who are in this space, it's sort of like almost a no-brainer. You not only have people funding your work up front, but you also have your commercial plan all set up and ready uh, for them to purchase the product once you're done with it and stockpile it um, in perpetuity, perhaps, if it's the right product. So it's a pretty, uh, you know, it's a pretty interesting sort of business model to sort of think about from that space. You had a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, for for barber purposes as opposed to other commercial uses, yeah, in other words, it's uh, only a bio defense use. Right, only bio in fact, in fact, that's what most of them will be. Most of them will be prob probably primarily a bio only a bio defense use when they are developed. If there happen to be some other uses that are developed for that, that's great. But their focus from a DoD perspective is to first. Um, protect the, uh, the war fighter in, th in theaters of war and the first responders who are coming in to essentially help uh, in the case of an accident and then the general population as the, th as the third uh, perspective. That's the first time I'm hearing that. I can double check that. If we can exchange business cards, I can confirm that with you. Uh, the person who runs the program, the contract program, will know the details of that very specifically if something has changed in BARDA's objective on that front. So we are sort of uh, uh, the last point I want to make is that the office has about 100 projects across all of these programs that we fund. Some are small, some are large. And again, going back to this idea of essentially being in the space to help with the handoff, what we are trying to do is that we, can, we, are, we want to tell you that we can help you with the matchmaking. And the way we have done this is that we have essentially created a list of all the active grants. And this is information that any one of you could find on the website if you spend some time you know, wading through NIH's um, 
uh, you know, various reporting systems. And I, I have hard copies of these I can show you uh, that, you know, it's just a you know, list of 100 projects where we have the indication, the project title, the PI, the institution, and the modality. So this week, for example, yesterday and the day before, I was handing these lists to VCs and, and, and pharma company BD folks to say, is there a subset of these projects you're interested in? And if they say, yes, I'm interested in project X, project Y, and they come back with a subset, which is what they've done in the past, then we provide them a little bit more information, which looks like this. We say, you know, here's the abstract of the project, how much money we're spending, when it started, et cetera. If you're still interested based on the mechanism of action, what we're trying to do, et cetera, and you really want to have a conversation, then we call up the company that, we, um, uh, that this is uh, from, or the university and say, hey, you know what, Pfizer wants to talk to you, or you know, uh, uh, New Enterprise Associates wants to have a conversation with you, are you interested? And as long as they don't have other competing conversations that they're having and they're willing to take the call, we put the two together and our job is done. We're not, we're not a third party in the discussion, we've done our job of bringing people together. And whether they just have a first date or they get married, it's up to them uh, after that. So that's something that we've started doing and we've had some initial success, both interest from people who are uh, looking at these lists, but also people who want to make sure that they have another avenue to ensure that their project actually gets out there in the eyes of people who are uh, potentially funding downstream activities. Through this exercise, we've also learned that NINDS can do things slightly differently in our programs in terms of what we can de-risk during those funding stages to make them more attractive to be picked up by other people. So some of those principles that we've learned have also been incorporated into our project plans and, and into the funding programs as we go forward you know, uh, in terms of the themes about you know, engagement of target and uh, thinking about the biomarker and thinking about the clinical plan. These are things we want to check off the list so that they don't, they're not gaping holes when you go for an initial conversation or a pitch to a potential investor. Okay, so this is the team uh, that I have assembled over the last three years with a lot of drug discovery experience at the NIH. Some of the company names might be familiar to you, so I'll just leave that up there. The two folks in orange are here, so I just highlighted them uh, with, with the years of experience both in, uh, in biotech and, and industry. So one of the things we've done at NINDS is we've sort of said, okay, if we're going to be in the space of translation, let's make sure that the team that's running it actually has experience in translation that can help the, help the grantee population with the work that's being done. And that's what we've really tried to assemble with the, with the human capital. So with that, I'll stop. And with any remaining time, I can take other questions that haven't already been addressed during the, during the session. Thank you. Any overview? Yes. Biologics uh, track, and uh, is there uh, an interest in infectious diseases at the uh, at the NINDS? In uh, uh, interest in what diseases? Infectious diseases. Infectious diseases. So infectious diseases of the brain specifically, or generally. Other, or, or so I mean, infectious organs. diseases as a category would go to uh, the institute of our next speaker, which is the Infectious Disease Institute you know, National Institute for Infectious Diseases, Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, but there are some places in which if it's an infect, for example, HIV in the brain. Mm -hmm. And so we have joint projects where when we are looking at HIV and how it, the brain might serve as a reservoir for HIV to be latent and then come back, we have, we have joint projects there where we might take primary assignment or they might take secondary assignment or the other way around depending on that interface. And there we'll just have the conversation to figure out who, which part of the NIH makes, it makes the most sense to sit with. But per se, if you pick a you know, garden variety infectious disease, and we don't, we don't, we don't fund that directly. Is, is the CREATE program only in NINDS, or is it across? Yes, other it's currently only NINDS. So uh, the idea that the CREATE program might potentially expand to other institutes signing up, I think it will take time. First of all, for the program to get its sea legs under it, mm -hmm. and then for other institutes to see that it might be successful and therefore that they might want to sign on and put their monies on. So that's usually the way it works at the NIH. Some institute comes up with a new mechanism, they put it out there, it gets tested, and then when people see, hey, this might be a better way for us to spend our money to do X, we'll sign on to that and we'll sunset some of our existing programs. So that's, you know, it's uh, too early to go there. A quick follow-on question on that. Um, Many times we were asked regarding oncology, glioblastoma, yes. is that same idea? Yeah, so glioblastoma is a slightly different um, uh, divide. Anything that's preclinical comes to us. 
But the moment there is a clinical trial, we hand over to NCI. So that's where the divide happens. So when they get something that's preclinical in GBM, they send it to us, and we take primary assignment. And then if something that's clinical that comes to us and you already have a candidate and everything is sorted out, then we say, go to NCI. They've got the right clinical networks or plans to essentially uh, run the trial that you want to run. Other questions? Okay, if not, I know I'm meeting with a subset of you one-on-one -on -one during the day, but I'm certainly available at, uh, throughout the day today at this meeting. And so are Amir and Chuck, maybe put up your hand, and he'll be in and out. So you can certainly talk to all three of us about any of these programs that we have talked about today and hope you will consider um, you know, coming on either to apply to the program and or maybe help with your expertise in the ways that I talked about as serving as consultants. Or One other pitch I will make is that many people often come to us and complain about, you know, I didn't get this grant when I applied. The, the, the reviewers are so stupid, they didn't understand what I uh, was proposing. You know, who, who picks these reviewers and et cetera, et cetera. I only have one response to that you have every chance to actually serve as a reviewer. And so, you know, that is the way to actually change the system, not from complaining from the outside, but actually be willing, being willing to be part of the solution. So put in your time, do the public service, then you can actually help improve what happens at review. There's no point finding a finger at the, at the people who are doing it because they volunteered, we picked them, and then they serve four-year terms, but they don't sit there forever. It's not tenure. So you can, you can certainly help impact that. It's three times a year. You read a bunch of grants. Some of it hopefully is exciting science that you're hopefully interested in. So it's not, it's not you know, we don't even give you coffee anymore, so I can't claim that there's any other perk benefits to it. But there is a component of essentially helping the science that you're interested in. Okay, with that, I'll stop. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.